escape from reality. Has anyone else ever noticed how sometimes we have these mysterious hidden rule sets for ourselves when we play a game? They're not necessarily written down or implied that you have to follow them, but sometimes they're in the back of your head and can affect the way that you play the game unconsciously. I'm not talking about Pokemon Nuzlocks or challenge modes either, I'm talking strictly about things in your head that you can't help but do. I guess the loosest example of what I'm talking about is playing through an RPG and always choosing the good options, mostly out of fear of hurting the other character's feelings. The characters who aren't real, but are rather a bunch of code, animation, and voice acting put into an interactive experience to give you the illusion they're real. It almost feels so odd that I care about what this game thinks of me. If a game character tells me they feel bad, I feel bad. And I have literally no reason to feel that way. As soon as I turn off the game, that character doesn't exist anymore. So why should it really matter? Obviously a lot of these games are meant to have multiple playthroughs, where you get to go back and try out different options and see how they affect your relationships with other characters. But on a first initial playthrough where you want to play just genuinely, does anyone really pick the obviously evil options? But despite me saying all this right now, that's actually not what this video is entirely about. While this is an example of the role playing one can do while playing these games, there are actually different invisible limitations I set on myself when playing games where you wouldn't think they exist. The rules I'm talking about are the ones that keep immersion together as closely as they can, even if it means doing something I don't want to do, or avoiding something that could help me. To be more specific about my example, I was thinking about sports games. Now I know a large percentage of you may not be interested in sports, but hear me out. Sports games are RPGs. You are role playing as a coach, team owner, player, general manager, etc. When you are controlling or playing one character, and I'll use hockey as an example and there be a pro mode, that character is you. You build their face, their stats their backstory if the game allows. There are no rules on how to play them, you just go out and be you. Some zone from the right side. Quick shot, scores! And the rookie gets his first! But in my brain, as soon as I play a different mode where I control people who actually exist in the real world, I feel this very weird obligation to stay true to them. For example, two of the greatest hockey players to ever play in my city of Vancouver are the Sedin twins, Henrik and Daniel. Extremely talented players, known for their incredible passing plays, but were also known for not really hitting all that much. Sure, they got hit a lot, but when it came to making plays, retrieving the puck, they chose skill over physicality. If I'm playing an NHL game with the Sedins in it, or someone like them, I don't hit with them. It feels weird, like I'm betraying who they were as not only players but as people. Like I'm breaking the immersion in my role playing experience, making them do things that they wouldn't do as players. Again, there's literally nothing to make me feel bad here. Not only that, the game isn't even trying to make me feel bad here. And yet, I feel that resistance in the back of my head, just a soft whisper saying, don't do it. You could argue that hitting with them as players wouldn't be very beneficial anyways because their stats are low in that category because in real life they don't hit. But it's not like the game can reasonably hide those options from you or go through every single player and say, well, he would never hit in this situation, so let's take it out and make it not possible. That would be more immersion breaking than anything. So I guess there's a part of me that feels like I have to uphold that part of the immersion. It's my responsibility to give myself the most accurate simulation of these games. Another weird example is jersey numbers. One of my favorite aspects of any sport is the numbers on the back of the jersey, and I can't really explain why, but I find it fascinating to know why certain players wear certain numbers. And trust me, I'm not the only one. People are passionate about jersey numbers. Some wear their number as tributes to another player, 
some wear their favorite player's number growing up, and some just stick with the number that they were randomly assigned as a rookie. Some wear their draft year, their birth year, some for the years of major political events from their home countries. So whenever a player gets traded and for whatever reason they can't wear their old number, they have to select a new one, and I'm always fascinated by what number they'll choose. Alex Goligoski just signed with the Minnesota Wild this offseason, and in doing so chose to wear number 47 because his number 33 was already taken. When asked, he simply said, well, my other numbers were taken, there's no reason for me to wear this number, I just thought it looked cool. Meanwhile, when Sergei Bobrovsky signed with the Florida Panthers a few years ago, another player, Frank Vetrano, was already wearing 72, which was Bobrovsky's number in Columbus. So, Bobrovsky bought Frank a Rolex watch just to make sure that he could wear that number. A number that he wasn't wearing at the start of his career in Philadelphia, but started wearing in Columbus. When I trade for a player in my games, I will go through their entire jersey history to when they were in junior as a kid just to see what number they would wear. If I see a player wearing a number that I don't think they'd ever wear, the immersion has again been broken, and it takes me right out of the game. Because of my habit in doing this, I can pretty much tell you any active player in the NHL's number right now. Because it feels like a disservice to have them wear anything else. Some players really don't care, but some care a lot more than you'd think, obviously enough to buy a Rolex for someone. And if they were to wear anything else, it would no longer feel like them. It would just feel like a random avatar with a bunch of stats. Another example of controlling real life people would be the WWE games. Now admittedly, I haven't played them in a long time, but even as a kid, I couldn't possibly imagine playing as someone like the 400 pound, 7 foot tall Big Show and jumping off of ladders or the top rope. The game gives me the option to do these things, but almost always I prefer not to. I can't explain the feeling, but when it's someone real, there's just this voice in the back of my head that says, you need to do it how they would do it. When I was a kid playing these games, they could also have a very tiny female wrestler body slam the big boys, so accuracy wasn't exactly a priority at this point. And while admittedly I haven't played much of the new games, I am aware that this is still sometimes an issue, and I think it might always be an issue. As much as you want wrestling games to be immersive, it would be so limiting to the point of extreme frustration to play a game that feels more like a scripted match than a game. Like, John Cena only has five moves, guys. He doesn't do anything that he does in the game. In these examples, I've of course used real people, and if you've watched hockey or wrestling and you see these names, you generally know how these people go about their business. But what about games where you're playing fictional characters? But it's not an RPG in the sense that you have a blank slate. Whenever I play games where I'm playing as one character who has a defined backstory and out of nowhere, the game gives me a choice, I always have this internal struggle. Do I pick how I would pick, or how the character would pick? Obviously in these situations, my choices are molding and forming the character, but sometimes I already know too much about the character to be free of the burden of what would they do. I think this is why Telltale's The Walking Dead game did so good the first time I played it. I never felt like any choice was completely unreasonable for Lee to make. At the very beginning, we know he's gone to prison, and right away we get to decide how he feels about it. He's new to us, but at the same time we know enough that we like him, but also not as much that we feel like he's overpowering us as the player. As we get into later seasons and you play as Clementine, you've been with this character for a few games already and you have a pretty solid foundation for who they are. Sometimes you come across a choice and go, well, obviously Clementine would do this, and that already changes how you're going to approach these decisions. Something else to mention is that the early games are very much spent molding Clementine as a person. And you might feel an obligation to stay the same Clementine that was mentored by Lee. Or perhaps you can just shut off your brain and make choices for yourself, and I envy you if that's the case. A game like Life is Strange also does this very well. The main feature of the first game is that when it comes to making major decisions, you can go back in time and see the immediate outcomes of both 
before finally picking one. You're given a fairly clean slate over Max, but it's definitely established that she's on the shy and introverted side of life. As a result, the decisions you're being asked to make aren't hang out with 50 people at a party for 40 hours straight versus go home and cry while watching the ending of Lord of the Rings. The choices that you're making, while sometimes small and subtle, with others larger and impacting the game more, both come from a similar mindset. I'd never let one of photography's future stars avoid handing in her picture. I didn't have any time. Way too much homework. Do I have to? I just don't think it's that big a deal. Max, you're a better photographer than a liar. She's shy, anxious, nervous, and non-confrontational. There's no point in these games where I feel like I'm doing something drastic that breaks the established Max Caulfield that I've been getting to know for the past however many hours. The decisions all feel like something she would do, and in the few cases where a choice does feel like something she wouldn't do, the dialogue ties it back in where it still feels like a reasonable Max decision. I am sorry. That's an awesome cashmere coat. Victoria probably played me. I should have played her. Don't say a word, Max. Oh, wait. Hold that yeah. pose. And no filter needed before I post this. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. The same could also be said about Chloe in Before the Storm. She's loud and abrasive and doesn't mind getting into an altercation. And the choices presented to you in the game reflect this. There's not a lot of options to just back down from a fight, especially in the smack-talking minigame. It can be very difficult giving your character an established background but also allowing the player to feel like they're in control and making the decisions that they want to make without the burden of the character's thoughts getting in the way. Now you could also argue that perhaps this is actually too limiting. Going back to Life is Strange, what if you wanted to play Max as a loud, abrasive, and outgoing character? And that's something that really isn't an option. Although then that would make the game very open-ended and account for way too many possibilities and perhaps get away from the story the developers were trying to tell altogether. They limit it, but in a good way. It wouldn't be the max that they needed for the story to work. But I can also safely say at no point in my original playthrough that I think, wow, I really wish I had this option. So I commend them for doing it in such a way where you still feel like you're playing a part and forming Max's personality when you're really not. Of course, this is my personal experience. I'm sure someone out there was frustrated at some decision they had to make. This could all be in my head. Perhaps when the majority of people play games, no one cares about what the character would do and they just focus on what they would do. But I refuse to believe that I'm the only one who goes through these tiny little conflicts. Sometimes I will literally play through a game twice because there's one way I want to do it, and then I'll go back and pick the options I think the character would have made. And then sometimes even a third time if there's more options I still didn't see. As I mentioned, a lot of these games that are based off decision making are often intended for people to go back and have multiple playthroughs, but what I'm really talking about here is that first playthrough. How do you decide? Is it you or the character? Another situation that was brought to my attention recently was a game Dishonored. When playing as Corvo, you have many decisions to make, but also you don't. Corvo has his own thoughts, his own goals. The player can't change that. What they can do is change how he goes about this, mainly whether or not he does it violently or peacefully. On a first playthrough, you may do a combination of peaceful playing and violent playing, and then go back afterwards and do a complete chaos run or a complete non-lethal run. The game doesn't completely unravel if you don't choose one or the other right away, but it does affect the ending that you'll get. Same can be said with a game like Bioshock and collecting the atoms from the Little Sisters, or Undertale where you can play true pacifist or genocide. These are decisions that you really shouldn't make before you play the game, you should just play the game. But sometimes once you know these things, it's hard to ignore them once you start. You feel like you have to commit to one side or the other before you've even turned on the game, 
and for some people, that's frustrating. The games I've mentioned so far are games where you're doing a lot of decision making while playing as a character with a set personality or story. There are plenty of games out there like Mass Effect or Dragon Age where the game gives you just enough so you don't feel like you're a total stranger in the world, but not too overbearing that you feel like you need to live up to some name. There's also games like the Elder Scrolls series that give you almost no slate at all, allowing for the personality of your character to be completely created by you. However, the downside to this is that you have no background to draw from, it's much more difficult to express yourself through your character's personality. There's no real way to be a funny person in Skyrim because you can't make people laugh through conversation. You can be aggressive to people, you can be kind and help them out, but in the end, your actions are who you are, not your words. Leaving the Elder Scrolls in games where you control characters with little personality expression behind, what do you do if you're playing a game where you control multiple people? When I think of controlling multiple characters in a game, the first one that comes to mind is XCOM. When my friend and I played through the game on Iron Man mode where all deaths are permanent, I controlled one half of the party and he controlled the other half. To spice it up, we tended to give our characters some very basic and one-dimensional character traits. It wasn't really intentional, it kind of just happened. He took uh, track and field in school, he wanted to show off. Ben Evans has got it. He was in track and field in high school. <laughs> Is that canon? I guess. <laughs> we wanted to grow an attachment to them, but also force ourselves to maybe do things that we wouldn't normally do. We could always play it safe, sure, but why not add something to the mix? We had characters who felt a certain attachment to one another, so they would always try to protect them. Do you see what I see? Uh, the <laughs> legacy continues. <laughs> Is this his sister I then? Evan's so ben Evans' sister is, is joining the thing. Okay. He probably did. He probably didn't even want her to join. Yeah. She was like, <clears> oh, <throat> it's a surprise. He's got to look after. He's got to look mm. after her. Armor tint twenty six. I mean, I'm sorry, but she has to have the same armor tint. They're related. Mm. Yeah. And what's mm. worse, she shows up wearing matching armor <laughs> <laughs> by accident. <clears throat> Like, like, oh, I, well, mom made this for me. <laughs> like, damn it, mom made this for me. <laughs> or a character who had a tendency to rush into battle a little too fast without proper backup. That's not covered. There's no cover there. I don't care. Well, what if when the next alien shows up? Hopefully he won't show up there. Or the healer that was so close to retirement that all he would do is just heal himself. Why is it that Voodoo, like her first mission, she almost died, and now her second mission, and she's almost dead? As my... Medics have to heal each other. That's so... <laughs> or the backup soldier who has been in the main lineup for years and yet his name is still backup, so he's a tad resentful of the rest of the group. This even brings up a different conversation entirely on how you establish these personalities. Do you customize their nickname, their appearance, and decide the personality type? Or do you determine their personality based off the nickname and appearance already given to them? Are you given someone with a clean slate, or can you mold them to however you want them to be? Well, that choice is yours, and that itself is another choice that you have to make in a game filled with choices. These things that we did were completely self-imposed. We didn't have to play this way, and I'm sure it would have been a lot easier if we didn't. Within the game's lore, you're actually considered the commander of the army, and your soldiers are essentially stripped of free will. They are chess pieces. This is obviously what you want if you're looking for a turn-based tactical game where you're the overall hive mind and controlling the battlefield like an Age of Empires game. But in this case, we knew we'd be able to beat the game easily if we had played it this way, and we just wanted to give it a different approach. The game didn't force us into that situation. We did. And to this day, it's the most memorable experience I've ever had playing XCOM. I find it hard to go back and play games now without thinking of those characters from that game. Once we established these character personalities in our heads, making decisions wasn't just about what we would do, it's what we believed the characters would do. Much like with any role-playing game, there may come points where you have to make choices that you really don't want to make, but for the overall experience, 
you go with what the character would do and it makes it that much more rewarding. One of the most original situations I've encountered that I have not experienced in any other game is Divinity Original Sin. We talked about how in hockey you have real people and you're trying to stay true to them. We talked about playing as an established personality and deciding on whether or not you would do what they would do or you would do what you would do. Holy shit, I need to reword that. We talked about playing as an established personality and deciding on whether or not to do what you would do or what they would do. And we talked about XCOM where you're controlling a bunch of chess pieces with guns. But in Divinity, you're controlling two characters, neither with an established personality, but there will be a lot of choices that will determine what their personality is as you play through the game. In Divinity Original Sin, you can play single player or multiplayer. Single player will allow you to absorb much more of the story, but multiplayer combat is some of the funnest multiplayer experiences I've ever had. It's basically turn-based D&D, and strategizing over what to do next is so much fun. I highly recommend it. However, regardless of how you play, there are two main characters to control. There is no designated main character and follower like you would think, even if you were playing single player, they are both equal parts main characters. During conversations, there are decisions that need to be made, whether you're trying to get information out of someone or deciding whether or not to kill someone, occasionally the two characters will begin a conversation with each other. I don't need an escort, especially not a drunken one. Back off or face me. Are you mad? You'd kill legionnaires? Let's just go to the wizard peacefully. Now if you have two players, you each control one character and control one side of the conversation. Well, I vote that we don't kill this guy, you vote that we do kill this guy, and then we play rock, paper, scissors to see who wins. However, if you're playing on your own, you have to act out both sides of the conversation. Now, if you feel like the obvious choice is don't kill the drunk guards in the tutorial, then great, both of your characters can say as such and you can move on. If you feel the obvious choice is to kill the guards in the tutorial, then great, both of your characters can say so, you kill the guards, and move on. However, you can make your characters argue with each other, and that will trigger a cutscene where you essentially play rock, paper, scissors against yourself, and your characters will have different points and different personality traits, and you can just let fate decide what action you take. The game's not forcing you to play this way, but the option is there, and it may lead to some very interesting situations for you. You are essentially controlling two D&D characters at the same time, and letting the decisions come down to a dice roll. Or, you know, they're twins who have the exact same process of thinking. If you choose to play with two conflicting arguing characters, they build up points in personality traits, meaning that some are stronger in arguments than others, such as reason versus intimidation, and it leads to another layer of how you as the player get to control these characters. This feels a lot different than a game where you're controlling a pre-established personality, but it follows a similar track. The biggest difference is that the personalities are 100% made up here, but whether you follow them or not is still up to you. Well, there we have it. Two dead legionnaires. They deserved it, the cretins. I'm not so sure anymore. It was a wicked thing we did. I think the beautiful part about games is that there's really no wrong way to play them. You control the character. You live the life, and your freedom is only limited by the game that you're playing. Whether an RPG where you decide the backstory and personality traits, or a game with a set character, there are still choices to be made. A video game character's personality is never truly defined, because once the player has control, sometimes they can take on a brand new life. My Shepherd is not your Shepherd. My Grey Warden is not your Great Warden, and my Dragonborn certainly is not your Dragonborn. Not every game needs to be non-linear, not every game needs tough choices to make, or any sort of choice. But as soon as a game presents you with one, it's your choice on how you're going to play it. 
you are immediately presented with replayability and a chance to do things a completely different way than you as the person would normally do it. But how do you play it the first time? Sometimes you want to play it the way that you would do it if you were there. And sometimes you decide to change it up and try to play it as if it were anyone else but you. And sometimes it's those playthroughs where you're taking over the galaxy as the true Sith Lord, winning the Stanley Cup with your childhood heroes who, in real life, never got to, saving the universe from certain doom while also trying to remain as sympathetic as possible, whether you're trying to save the world or letting it plunge into darkness, whether it's just about trying to survive or making the ultimate sacrifice. Whether you save the life of one, or save the life of them all. These games are fun. You get to be someone else for a small moment of time and get to make choices for them. But sometimes you can have the most memorable and rewarding experiences playing as someone else entirely. Hello everybody, my name is Ghostboy259. Thank you very much for watching all the way to the end. I know this wasn't the biggest video I could have come back on, but I was a little limited for time, so it's just something a little bit smaller and easier, but I will be uploading a lot more for the next little bit from here on out. So if you watched all the way to the end, thank you very much and a huge thanks to my patrons, whether they've been around for a year or just in the last month. Thank you very much, your support means everything to me and I wouldn't be able to do this without you guys. If you're interested in supporting and you want a behind the scenes exclusive video on how this or any other videos on my channel were made, feel free to check out the Patreon, the third tier has a bunch of behind the scenes stuff on how I wrote it, how the editing went, how I chose what games I chose, stuff like that. I also live stream on Twitch and I have a Twitter and all that stuff. Links are all down below in the description if you're interested in helping support me besides just being a YouTube viewer. And let, leave a comment. Let me know what you guys think about these games. If you guys have ever had one of these decisions that you've had to make or if you guys have any immersive immersion rules that you guys try to hold on while you're playing. I'd love to know if I'm the only one out there or if there's other people like me. But that's it. Thank you very much everyone. Stay safe. I will see you very soon.